Section 4 of Tanar of Pellucidar by Edgar Rice Burroughs. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Tanar of Pellucidar. Chapter 3 A Meal Cap. The blue waters of the great sea known as Corsar As wash the shores of a green island far from the mainland, a long narrow island with verdure clad hills and plateaus its coastline indented by coves and tiny bays. A meocap, an island of mystery and romance. At a distance, and when there is haze upon the waters, it looks like two islands rather than one, so low and narrow it is at one point, where coves run in on either side and the sea almost meets. Thus it appeared to the two survivors from the deck of the Corsar derelict, drifting helplessly with the sluggish run of an ocean current and at the whim of vagrant winds. Time is not even a word to the people of Pellucidar, so Tanar had given no thought to that. They had eaten many times, but as there was still an ample supply of provisions, even for a large ship's company, he felt no concern upon that score, but he had been worried by the depletion of their supply of good water for the contents of many casks that he had broached had been undrinkable. They had slept much, which is the way of Pellucidarians when there is naught else to do, storing energy for possible future periods of long-drawn exertion. They had been sleeping thus, for how long, who may say, in the measureless present of Pellucidar. Stellara was the first to come on deck from the cabin she had occupied next to that of the Cid. She looked about for Tanar, but not seeing him, she let her eyes wander out over the upcurving expanse of water that merged in every direction with the blue-domed vault of the brilliant sky, in the exact center of which hung the great noonday sun. But suddenly her gaze was caught and held by something beside the illimitable waters and the ceaseless sun. She voiced a surprised and joyous cry and turning, ran across the deck toward the cabin in which Tanar slept. "'Tanar! Tanar!' she cried, pounding upon the paneled door. "'Land, Tanar! Land!' The door swung open, and the Sarian stepped out upon the deck where Stellara stood pointing across the starboard rail of the drifting derelict. Close by rose the green hills of a long shoreline that stretched away in both directions for many miles but whether it was the mainland or an island they could not tell. Land, breathed Tanar. How good it looks! The pleasant green of the soft foliage often hides terrible beasts and savage men, Stellar reminded him. But they are dangers that I know. It is the unknown dangers of the sea that I do not like. I am not of the sea. You hate the sea? No he replied, I do not hate it, I do not understand it, that is all. But there is something that I do understand. And he pointed toward the land. There was that in Tanar's tone that caused Alara to look quickly in the direction that he indicated. Men! she exclaimed. Warriors! said Tanar. There must be twenty of them in that canoe, she said and here comes another canoeful behind them. From the mouth of a narrow cove the canoes were paddling out into the open sea. "'Look!' cried Stellara. "'There are many more coming!' One after another twenty canoes moved in a long column out upon the quiet waters, and as they drew steadily toward the ship the survivors saw that each was filled with almost naked warriors. Short, heavy spears, bone-tipped, bristled menacingly. Stone knives protruded from every g-string, and stone hatchets swung at every hip. As the flotilla approached, Tanar went to a cabin, and returned with two of the heavy pistols, left behind by a fleeing corsar when the ship had been abandoned. "'Do you expect to repulse four hundred warriors with those?' asked the girl. Tanar shrugged. If they have never heard the report of a firearm, a few shots may suffice to frighten them away, for a time at least," he explained. And if we do not go on the shore, the current will carry us away from them in time. 
But suppose they do not frighten so easily? she demanded. Then I can do no more than my best with the crude weapons and the inferior powder of the Corsars, he said with the conscious superiority of one who had, with his people, so recently emerged from the Stone Age that he often instinctively grasped a pistol by the muzzle and used it as a war club in sudden emergencies when at close quarters. Perhaps they will not be unfriendly, suggested Stellara. Tanar laughed. Then they are not of Pellucidar, he said, but of some wondrous country inhabited by what Perry calls angels. Who is Perry? she demanded. I never heard of him. He is a madman, who says that Pellucidar is the inside of a hollow stone, that is as round as the strange world that hangs forever above the land of awful shadow, and that upon the outside are seas and mountains and plains and countless people and a great country from which he comes. He must be quite mad, said the girl. Yet he and David, our emperor, have brought us many advantages that were before unknown in Pellucidar so that now we can kill more warriors in a single battle than was possible before during the course of a whole war. Perry calls this civilization, and it is indeed a very wonderful thing. Perhaps he came from the frozen world from which the ancestors of the Corsars came, suggested the girl. They say that that country lies outside of Pellucidar. Here is the enemy, said Tenar. Shall I fire at that big fellow standing in the bow of the first canoe?" Tanner raised one of the heavy pistols and took aim, but the girl laid a hand upon his arm. "'Wait,' she begged. "'They may be friendly. Do not fire unless you must. I hate killing.' "'I can well believe that you are no corsar,' he said, lowering the muzzle of his weapon. There came a hail from the leading canoe. We are prepared for you, Corsars," shouted the tall warrior standing in the bow. You are few in numbers. We are many. Your great canoe is a useless wreck. Ours are manned by twenty warriors each. You are helpless. We are strong. It is not always thus, and this time it is not we who shall be taken prisoners, but you if you attempt to land. But we are not like you, Corsars. We do not want to kill or capture. Go away, and we shall not harm you." "'We cannot go away,' replied Tanar. "'Our ship is helpless. We are only two, and our food and water are nearly exhausted. Let us land and remain until we can prepare to return to our own countries.' The warrior turned and conversed with the others in his canoe. Presently he faced Tanar again. No he said. My people will not permit Corsars to come among us. They do not trust you. Neither do I. If you do not go away, we shall take you as prisoners, and your fate will be in the hands of the Council of the Chiefs." "'But we are not Corsars,' explained Tanar. The warrior laughed. "'You speak a lie,' he said. "'Do you think that we do not know the ships of Corsar?' This is a Corsar ship," replied Tanar, but we are not Corsars. We were prisoners, and when they abandoned their ship in a great storm they left us aboard." Again the warriors conferred, and those in other canoes that had drawn alongside the first joined in the discussion. "'Who are you, then?' demanded the spokesman. "'I am Tanar of Pellucidar. My father is King of Sari. We are all of Pellucidar," replied the warrior, but we never heard of a country called Sari. And the woman, she is your mate?" No, cried Stellara haughtily, I am not his mate. Who are you? Are you a Sarian also? I am no Sarian. My father and mother were of a meocap. Again the warriors talked among themselves some seeming to favor one idea, some another. "'Do you know the name of this country?' finally demanded the leading warrior, addressing Stellara. "'No,' she replied. 
We were about to ask you that very question," said Tenar. "'And the woman is from a Meocap? demanded the warrior. "'No other blood flows in my veins,' said Stellara proudly. "'Then it is strange that you do not recognize your own land and your own people,' cried the warrior. "'This is the island of a Meocap. Stellara voiced a low cry of pleased astonishment. A meocap, she breathed softly as to herself. The tone was a caress, but the warriors in the canoes were too far away to hear her. They thought she was silent and embarrassed because they had discovered her deception. "'Go away!' they cried again. "'You will not send me away from the land of my parents!' cried Stellara in astonishment. "'You have lied to us,' replied the tall warrior. "'You are not of a meocap. You do not know us, nor do we know you.' "'Listen,' cried Tenar. "'I was a prisoner aboard this ship, and being no corsar, the girl told me her story long before we sighted this land. She could not have known that we were near your island. I do not know that she even knew its location, but nevertheless I believe that her story is true. She has never said that she was from Mamiocap, but that her parents were. She has never seen the island before now. Her mother was stolen by the corsars before she was born." Again the warriors spoke together in low tones for a moment, and then once more the spokesman addressed Stellara. "'What was your mother's name?' he demanded. Who was your father?" "'My mother was called Alara,' replied the girl. "'I never saw my father, but my mother said that he was a chief and a great Tandor hunter called Fedal.'" At a word from the tall warrior in the bow of the leading canoe, from the warriors paddled slowly nearer the drifting hulk, and as they approached the ship's waist, Tanar and Stellara descended to the main deck which was now almost awash, so deep the ship rode because of the water in her hold, and as the canoe drifted alongside, the warriors, with the exception of a couple, laid down their paddles and stood ready with their bone-tipped spears. Now the two upon the ship's deck and the tall warrior in the canoe stood almost upon the same level and face to face. The latter was a smooth-faced man with finely molded features, and clear gray eyes that bespoke intelligence and courage. He was gazing intently at Stellara, as though he would search her very soul for proof of the veracity or falsity of her statements. Presently he spoke. "'You might well be her daughter,' he said. "'The resemblance is apparent.' "'You knew my mother?' exclaimed Stellara. "'I am Volhan. You have heard her speak of me?' My mother's brother!" exclaimed Stellara, with deep emotion, but there was no answering emotion in the manner of the Amiocap warrior. "'My father, where is he? Is he alive?' "'That is the question,' said Volhan seriously. "'Who is your father? Your mother was stolen by a corsar. If the corsar is your father, you are a corsar.' "'But he is not my father.' Take me to my own father. Although he has never seen me, he will know me and I shall know him." "'It will do no harm,' said a warrior who stood close to Volhan. "'If the girl is a corsar, we shall know what to do with her.' "'If she is the spawn of the corsar who stole Alara, Volhan and Fedal will know how to treat her,' said Volhan savagely. "'I am not afraid,' said Stellara. And this other," said Volhan, nodding toward Tanar, what of him? He was a prisoner of war that the Corsars were taking back to Corsar. Let him come with you. His people are not sea people. He could not survive by the sea alone. You are sure that he is no Corsar? demanded Volhan. Look at him, exclaimed the girl. The men of Amiocap must know the people of Corsar well by sight. Does this one look like a Corsar?" Volhen was forced to admit that he did not. "'Very well,' he said. "'He may come with us. 
but whatever your fate, he must share it." Gladly, agreed Tanar. The two quit the deck of the derelict as places were made for them in the canoe, and as the little craft was paddled rapidly toward the shore, neither felt any sorrow at parting from the drifting hulk that had been their home for so long. The last they saw of her, just as they were entering the cove from which they had first seen the canoes emerge, she was drifting slowly with the ocean current parallel with the green shore of a meal cap. At the upper end of the cove, the canoes were beached and dragged beneath the concealing foliage of the luxuriant vegetation. Here they were turned bottom-side up and left until occasion should again demand their use. The warriors of a meocap conducted their two prisoners into the jungle that grew almost to the water's edge. At first there was no sign of trail and the leading warriors forced their way through the lush vegetation, which, fortunately, was free from thorns and briars, but presently they came upon a little path which opened into a broad, well-beaten trail, along which the party moved in silence. During the march, Tanar had an opportunity to study the men of a meal cap more closely, and he saw that, almost without exception, they were symmetrically built, with rounded, flowing muscles that suggested a combination of agility and strength. Their features were regular and there was not among them one who might be termed ugly. On the whole, their expressions were open rather than cunning, and kindly rather than ferocious. Yet the scars upon the bodies of many of them, and their well-worn and efficient-looking though crude weapons, suggested that they might be bold hunters and fierce warriors. There was a marked dignity in their carriage and demeanor which appealed to Tanar, as did their taciturnity for the Sarians themselves are not given to useless talk. Stellara, walking at his side, appeared unusually happy, and there was an expression of contentment upon her face that the Sarian had never seen there before. She had been watching him as well as the Amio Capians, and now she addressed him in a whisper. "'What do you think of my people?' she asked proudly. "'Are they not wonderful?' "'They are a fine race.' he replied, and I hope for your sake that they will believe that you are one of them. "'It is all just as I have dreamed it so many times,' said the girl with a happy sigh. "'I have always known that some day I should come to a meal-cap, and that it would be just as my mother told me that it was. The great trees, the giant ferns, the gorgeous flowering vines and bushes.' There are fewer savage beasts here than in other parts of Pellucidar, and the people seldom war among themselves, so that for the most part they live in peace and contentment, broken only by the raids of the corsars, or an occasional raid upon their fields and villages by the great Tandors. Do you know what Tandors are, Tanar? Do you have them in your country? Tanar nodded. I have heard of them in Amoz, he said, though they are rare in Sari. There are thousands of them upon the island of Amiocap, said the girl, and my people are the greatest Tandor hunters in Pellucidar. Again they walked on in silence, Tanar wondering what the attitude of the Amiocapians would be towards them, and if friendly, whether they would be able to assist him in making his way back to the distant mainland where Sari lay. To this primitive mountaineer, it seemed little short of hopeless even to dream of returning to his native land, for the sea appalled him, nor did he have any conception as to how he might set a course across its savage bosom, or navigate any craft that he might later find at his disposal. Yet so powerful is the homing instinct in the Pellucidarians that there was no doubt in his mind that so long as he lived he would always be searching for a way back to Sari. He was glad that he did not have to worry about Stellara, for if it was true that she was among her own people, she could remain upon a meal cap and there would rest upon him no sense of responsibility for her return to Corsar. But if they did not accept her, that was another matter. Then Tanar would have to seek for means of escape from an island peopled by enemies, and he would have to take Stellara with him. But this train of thought was interrupted by a sudden exclamation from Stellara. "'Look!' 
she cried. Here is a village. Perhaps it is the very village of my mother. What did you say? inquired a warrior, walking near them. I said that perhaps this is the village where my mother lived before she was stolen by the corsars. And you say that your mother was Alara? inquired the warrior. Yes. This was indeed the village in which Alara lived, said the warrior. But do not hope, girl, that you will be received as one of them, for unless your father also was of a Meocap, you are not an Meocapian. It will be hard to convince anyone that you are not the daughter of a Corsar father, and as such you are a Corsar and no Meocapian. But how can you know that my father was a Corsar? demanded Stellara. We do not have to know, replied the warrior. It is merely a matter of what we believe, but that is a question that will have to be settled by Zurel, the chief of the village of Lar. Lar, repeated Stellara, that is the village of my mother. I have heard her speak of it many times. This, then, must be Lar. It is, replied the warrior, and presently you shall see Zurel. The village of Lar consisted of perhaps a hundred thatched huts, each of which was divided into two or more rooms, one of which was invariably an open sitting-room without walls, in the centre of which was a stone fireplace. The other rooms were ordinarily tightly walled and windowless, affording the necessary darkness for the Amiocapians when they wished to sleep. The entire clearing was encircled by the most remarkable fence that Tanar had ever seen. The posts, instead of being set in the ground, were suspended from a heavy fiber rope that ran from tree to tree, the lower ends of the posts hanging at least four feet above the ground. Holes had been bored through the posts at intervals of twelve or eighteen inches, and into these were inserted hardwood stakes, four or five feet in length and sharpened at either end. These stakes protruded from the posts in all directions, parallel with the ground and the posts were hung at such a distance from one another that the points of the stakes, protruding from contiguous posts, left intervals of from two to four feet between. As a safeguard against an attacking enemy they seemed futile to Tanar, for in entering the village the party had passed through the open spaces between the posts without being hindered by the barrier. But conjecture as to the purpose of this strange barrier was crowded from his thoughts by other more interesting occurrences, for no sooner had they entered the village than they were surrounded by a horde of men, women, and children. "'Who are these?' demanded some. "'They say that they are friends,' replied Volhan. "'But we believe that they are from Corsar.' "'Corsars!' cried the villagers. "'I am no Corsar,' cried Stellara angrily. I am the daughter of Alara, the sister of Vulhan. "'Let her tell that to Zurel. It is his business to listen, not ours,' cried one. "'Zurel will know what to do with Corsars. Did they not steal his daughter and kill his son?' "'Yes, take them to Zurel,' cried another. "'It is to Zurel that I am taking them,' replied Vulhan. The villagers made their way for the warriors and their prisoners, and as the latter passed through the aisles thus formed, many were the ugly looks cast upon them, and many the expressions of hatred that they overheard, but no violence was offered them, and presently they were conducted to a large hut near the centre of the village. Like the other dwellings of the village of Lar, the floors of the chief's house were raised a foot or eighteen inches above the ground. The thatched roof of the great open living-room into which they were conducted was supported by enormous ivory tusks of the giant tandors. The floor, which appeared to be constructed of unglazed tile, was almost entirely covered by the hides of wild animals. There were a number of low wooden stools standing about the room, and one higher one that might almost have been said to have attained the dignity of a chair. Upon this larger stool was seated a stern-faced man, who scrutinized them closely and silently as they were halted before him. For several seconds no one spoke. Then the man upon the chair turned to Vulhan. "'Who are these?' he demanded. 
and what do they in the village of Lar? We took them from a Corsar ship that was drifting helplessly with the ocean current, said Vulhan, and we have brought them to Zurl, chief of the village of Lar, that he may hear their story and judge whether they be the friends they claim to be, or the Corsar enemies that we believe them to be. This one, and Volhan pointed to Stellara, says that she is the daughter of Alara. I am the daughter of Alara, said Stellara. And who was your father? demanded Zurl. My father's name is Fedal, replied Stellara. How do you know? asked Zurl. My mother told me. Where were you born? demanded Zurl. In the Corsar city of Alaban, replied Stellara. Then you are a Corsar, stated Zurl with finality. And this one, what has he to say for himself? asked Zurl, indicating Tanar with a nod. He claims that he was a prisoner of the Corsars, and that he comes from a distant kingdom called Sari. I have never heard of such a kingdom, said Zurl. Is there any warrior here who has ever heard of it? he demanded. If there is, let him in justice to the prisoner speak. But the Meocapians only shook their heads, for there was none who had ever heard of the kingdom of Sari. It is quite plain, continued Zurl, that they are enemies, and that they are seeking by falsehood to gain our confidence. If there is a drop of Ammiocapian blood in one of them, we are sorry for that drop. Take them away, Volhan. Keep them under guard until we decide how they shall be destroyed. My mother told me that the Ammiocapians were a just and kindly people, said Stellara, but it is neither just nor kindly to destroy this man who is not an enemy simply because you have never heard of the country from which he comes. I tell you that he is no Corsar. I was on one of the ships of the fleet when the prisoners were brought aboard. I heard the Cid and Bohar the Bloody when they were questioning this man, and I know that he is no Corsar, and that he comes from a kingdom known as Sari. They did not doubt his word, so why should you? If you are a just and kindly people, how can you destroy me without giving me an opportunity to talk with Fedal, my father? He will believe me. He will know that I am his daughter. The gods frown upon us if we harbor enemies in our village," replied Zurl. We should have bad luck, as all Ameocapians know. Wild beasts would kill our hunters, and the Tandors would trample our fields and destroy our villages. But worst of all, the Corsars would come and rescue you from us. As for Fedal, no man knows where he is. He is not of this village, and the people of his own village have slept and eaten many times since they saw Fedal. They have slept and eaten many times since Fedal set forth upon his last Tandor hunt. Perhaps the Tandors have avenged the killing of many of their fellows, or perhaps Fedal fell into the clutches of the buried people. These things we do not know but we do know that Fedal went away to hunt Tandors, and that he never came back, and that we do not know where to find him. Take them away, Volhen, and we shall hold a council of the chiefs, and then we shall decide what shall be done with them." "'You are a cruel and wicked man, Zurl," cried Stellara, "'and no better than the Corsars themselves.' "'It is useless, Stellara said Tenar, laying a hand upon the girl's arm. Let us go quietly with Volhan. And then, in a low whisper, Do not anger them, for there is yet hope for us in the council of the chiefs if we do not antagonize them. And so, without further word, Stellara and Tanar were led from the house of Zurl the chief, surrounded by a dozen stalwart warriors. End of section 4